Hello, good day to all. So I am G Venkata Prasad, Director of Operations for DFI India, responsible for operation of DFI. I am uh, with DFI India for last two and a half years. So earlier to that, uh, so I was with uh, LNT for 35 years. So had an opportunity to handle the major uh, projects assignments. So welcome you all for the today's. Uh, the first web series for program so this all requests you to note that uh, recording of this webinar is prohibited so you will get uh, certificates prepared and emailed in two weeks time we'll also have uh, online uh, recording uh, webinar recording facility in the uh, next two weeks time in case uh, you require any assistance uh, so please reach out to our DFI India colleagues, T.S. Mahendran and Pranoja, so the respective members. Yeah, you have an option of uh, uploading questions as a part of uh, this uh, webinar program. So there's a facility. There's a, you can uh, open that icon and uh, so type your questions. So it will be registered and at the end of the session, presentation session, so, so it will be answered. So you also have a facility to open handouts. So we have an interesting DFO India 2020 conference from brochures and other webinar details are available. So we request you to just go through and so that you, you can avail these opportunities. Yeah, thankful to ArcelorMittal. Uh, this program is being uh, sponsored by them. So as a part of uh, this program, so you will uh, see their uh, video also, the kind of uh, activities they take up. Uh, so thank you, ArcelorMittal. So we have an uh, interesting mix of uh, delegates uh, comprising all stakeholders, uh, right from contractors, uh, specialist contractors and consultants, equipment manufacturers, service providers. So we have a good uh, percentage from students also. Uh, thankful to all of them. So even owner represented also. You can uh, see that uh, the percentage uh, attendance from these uh, groups. Thank you for uh, global participants uh, representation from 30 countries. Uh, yeah, DFI uh, programs are quite popular. So I'm sure so you'll uh, get benefited uh, by today's uh, program also. Welcome you all from uh, different countries. So we have uh, on, uh, today's agenda. So we'll have a quick introduction of speaker. So followed up by the presentation. We have a few promotional videos and uh, there's a question answer uh, session. So we'll uh, quickly run through DFI India virtual conference. So DFI India is into uh, interesting initiatives that will benefit India. So we'll share about that other information and uh, so, so we'll close the webinar uh, program. So we have with us uh, today, uh, Mr. Joe Martins. Uh, Head of for Technical and Marketing Department, representing Arcel Metal from Luxembourg office. Um, so, I will run through is the CV in the next slide. And uh, Ms. Martin started his professional career in 1996 as an inspection engineer in a consulting firm in Luxembourg. He moved to Arcel Metal in 1999 where he had uh, several positions in the technical and marketing department of the sheet piling department. He started designing sheet piles for customers, and worked as a resident engineer in the USA for three years, where he was in charge of technical assistance. He had the opportunity to visit many job sites all around the world during this period. The period. So we have uh, the opportunity of uh, utilizing his expertise today. So he works now in the marketing department. He's also the link between R&D and the sales department. The man mission is 
His main mission is to develop and promote new and innovative sheet pile solutions. So welcome Joe Martin. So, so I request to take over and to make a presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Prasad. Um, I would like also to thank DFI India for organizing this uh, series of webinars on steel foundations and steel retaining structures. Um, so basically, the next 45 minutes, I will um, introduce you to the basic design rules uh, for steel retaining systems and some optimization potential. So the, the presentation is subdivided in three uh, different um, uh, parts. The first one will be a more general one, which is uh, explaining the different structures that can be built with the steel sheet pass. The second one will be more focusing on the geotechnical design. And the third one will be uh, focusing on the steel design. And we'll wrap up with a summary of uh, the whole presentation. So to move around to the next slide. I would always like to start with a, a short definition of a steel sheet pile and a steel sheet pile wall. So most of the time, the majority of the sheet piles are hot rolled corrugated sheets. Their particular feature is the interlock. So the interlocks is relatively difficult to roll. And that's also one of the reasons why uh, there are not many manufacturers of um, sheet pile uh, worldwide. Another thing, uh, that is a specific feature for sheet piling is uh, that it is meant to form a continuous wall. It can be a retaining wall, which is most of the time, but it can also be simply a confinement wall. And very important is the interlock because the interlock that you see here, which is the last interlock, is has been developed by a German engineer over 100 years ago. And still, we believe that this is the best interlock that uh, has been developed. For uh, one good reason, it's um, quite tight, so that it is relatively watertight, but also it prevents soil from passing through the interlocks. And on the other side, it has sufficient sufficient space for being able to drive the sheet pass without too many friction on the interlock. So this type of sheet pass resists resist predominantly through bending, which is not the case of uh, the flat sheet pass that we'll see in the next slide. There is a myriad of uh, sections. So we have a Z type sections, we have U type sections, like you see it here. So if you have a little bit of imagination, you'll see that if you turn it over, this looks like a new, this is like a Z. We have also combined wall systems, which are comprising a king pile, which we call HZM, that you see here, with infill sheets or without infill sheets. And then we have this flat sheet pass, which resists through interlock tension, uh, as you'll see in the next slide. Interesting also is to, uh, to know is that uh, each sheet pile is available in different thicknesses. So this means that, uh, for instance, the AZ38 that you see here has a thickness of 18 millimeters in the flange, but it can be rolled with 17 millimeters and it can also be rolled with 19 millimeters. So this gives a lot of flexibility in order to optimize the solution at, um, for each specific project. And we'll see how to do that in one of the next slides. So flat sheet piles are also called straight web sheet piles. They resist only through interlock tension. What we can build with those are circular cells and diaphragm cells, as you can see here. So circular cells because it's a circular and diaphragm because you have what we call a diaphragm. So it's a straight wall and then an arc in between. The advantage of this type of uh, uh, cells is that they don't need necessarily an embedment. So you can actually uh, make it rest on the bedrock. So you don't need this very high embedment. Actually, typically, you might even not have an embedment in the soil. And the main feature that we'll see also in another webinar is that um, <clears throat> the tension in the interlocks depends on the radius and also on the pressure inside. So this means that uh, this type of solution is adequate for diameters ranging from 15 meters up to around 25 to 30 meters, depends on the height, depends also on the soil. Normally it's filled with the granular soil, but if you use different soils, then um, you might have some limitations. If you look at the applications, we have subdivided our um, 
applications in four groups and then there's another one which is a temporary but for permanent applications we have the what we call water transport solutions so these are breakwaters key walls jetties i would say that about 50 percent of the sheet piles that are manufactured worldwide go into uh, water solutions then we have what we call hazard protection solutions these are dikes dams river embankments so for flood protection screens mobility infrastructure solutions is something that's not uh, very well uh, known in a lot of countries. So bridge abutments, for instance, tunnels, underpasses, foundations, also basements and underground car parks can be built with sheet piles, not only for the temporary excavation, but also for the permanent one. And then we have what we call environmental protection solutions. This is more like a confinement wall in order to make sure that uh, <clears throat> polluted material, be it water or soil, does not pass through a certain limit so the sheet pass will actually confine the soil like a landfill or things like this. Um, <clears throat> a few pictures of the applications and then we'll go to the structures. So permanent applications and one of the advantage of this type of uh, solution is that you can build the wall into the water so you don't need first to dredge or to backfill before you can install the sheet pile wall and then you can backfill at the same time. So this is a key wall which um, has been built with a combined wall system in Poland into the water and then for permanent applications also uh, a retaining wall very simple one here you see a retaining wall which is anchored it has one anchored and you see another feature it's the coating so quite often the architects or the um, project owners they don't like the rusty feel and look of the steel so they prefer to have an, an, a paint on the other side on the side with the soil as you can see here there's no painting because corrosion is relatively low on the soil side so we'll also have that on one slide for temporary structures it's quite interesting so sheet paths can be reused a couple of times so most of the times we believe that um, if you use the correct sheet pad for the correct soil you can reuse them up to five times we have seen people using them more than 10 times but this is quite rare so actually if you are using it for a specific job site you can drive the sheet pass to this uh, trench and then after you build the structure inside you can extract them and then redrive them a couple of times as i said up to five times so that they will be reused and that's um, a big advantage of sheet pass compared to other solutions for uh, this type of permanent uh, sorry for temporary structures and of course one of the applications where sheet pass have been developed for is more in the water so they are quite watertight and you can build these coffer dams once you have the coffer dam it is relatively watertight but even if you have some water that percolates through the interlocks you have the possibility to use the pumps to dewater inside of it so it's something that uh, is quite often used if you have to build a bridge in the middle of the water in the middle of the river for instance and um, you see also here already that most of the time in this type of coffer dams have at least one level of um, struts. So for, the, for waterfront structures, <clears throat> cantilever walls, or cantilever walls for key walls, for instance, are quite rare, but sometimes it, it, they are used. I mean, if you have only three or four meters to uh, cope with, then the cantilever wall might be the solution. It's a relatively long wall, as you'll see, but <clears throat> it don't need, doesn't need any anchors. So most of the time for an anchor, for a container wall or things like this, you'll see this type of structure where you have the main wall, which we call head wall, an anchor and then the anchor wall which is normally also sheet pile so this is a typical way to do it however if you want to save some money and if you can install uh, anchors below water like you see it on this uh, sketch then you will have shorter sheet piles and you will also need lighter sheet piles so this is an alternative but very often install the anchors below water is a little bit more risky and a lot of uh, the con contractors don't like to do it it can also be an active anchor so grouted or like uh, we have seen it in the states uh, mainly where you have an anchor a tie rod that is anchored to a concrete block and uh, this is uh, connected to um, piles one is working in tension the other one in compression a few pictures as i said so the advantage uh, you don't have any preparation works you can work in the on the installation of the sheet pile wall and at the same time on the backfilling 
so that you save uh, some time compared to alternative solutions. Uh, <clears throat> pictures of um, a project in India, which is still ongoing, which will be probably ready by next year, where we supplied almost uh, 11,000 tons of uh, the combined wall system, which is the HZ. So here you see the ship yacht, which is in Cochin. It's around 310 meters and a depth of 13 meters. And on this picture, you see the driving of the King Power, so the driving of the HZ. And as we will explain in another webinar, Normally, the king pies are driven first, and then you install the infill sheets. So this is quite impressive because the sheet pies were up to 44 meter long, and they were supplied in uh, one length directly from the mill, which is quite an achievement. And it is an example which is quite rare nowadays, but uh, in Denmark, in the port of Kalundborg, they have used this underwater anchor, which is at uh, an elevation of minus six and minus uh, five here. There are two sections. And you see that for a dredge level of minus 15, you would probably need, in most cases, a combined wall system. And with this system, you can use a regular sheet pass or corrugated here, an AU23. So the installation is a little bit more complex. And of course, you need to have the right uh, geometry of the existing soil. Now, another project uh, that we supplied uh, in India almost 10 years ago, it's the bulk purse extension for the ASA terminal where we supplied flat sheet paths. So flat sheet paths for this 1.1 kilometer long uh, burst, um, a little bit more than 11,000 tons, and with an interlock strength of 5,500 kilonewton per meter, which is quite ex impressive. So you have to imagine on one meter, you can pull on the sheets with a force, which is 550 tons. The interesting thing about this is that um, it's a little bit more complex to install. So you need a template, a template. If you have the right template and if you do it according to the procedure, it goes very smooth. But if the template is not good, then you can get into a lot of trouble at the beginning. But here uh, they had a very good template and they did a, a good job. So for the waterfront structures, you have also the alternative where uh, you can build deck on piles or a living platform. So there is a small difference uh, between both of them. So the deck on piles are relatively wide structure where you have a lot of concrete deck and a lot of uh, piles. So we have to install the piles and then build the concrete. And the other alternative, which is with a narrow structure, and we call it uh, like a, a relieving platform, where you need a shallow slope, which is almost stable, which is easier to stabilize than for the other one. And then you have at the front a combined wall system, which leaves the water pass uh, through so it doesn't close. And you have also a sheet pile wall at the back. So this is a relatively narrow and compact structure. Of course, it will depend on the soil conditions, which one is the uh, most cost effective, but uh, there are uh, two possibilities to do that. And I have a picture, for instance, of uh, one of those relieving platforms that the Germans have done in the past. So this was 2008, 1.7 kilometer long uh, sheet pile wall. And as you can see, we supplied more than 40,000 tons. So it's a huge project where they were installing here the infill sheets. So here it's a, a phase where they are, have already installed the king piles. And then here they are installing the um, battered piles. So they are working in tension, as you can see here. So they don't have any tie rods on the sketch. They have battered piles that they drive with a certain inclination. And they, uh, here they had up to 55 meter long lengths. And also for the king piles, the H said they were up to 44 meter long. So 44.10, that was the maximum for a dredge level of minus 20, but the design level was at minus 23. So they increased the design level by about three meters to be sure that they didn't have any problems with scouring and things like this. Another interesting feature with the sheet pass and the combined wall system is that you can um, deepen uh, an existing deck on pass, like you see here, where they wanted to increase the depth by about 10 feet, so approximately three meters. And the solution that they found is to drive a king pile in front of it with the infill sheets that are shorter, so just to step uh, to secure the, um, the slope. And then the king piles were cut at the right elevation, fixed to the concrete deck, and, and that was it. So the infill sheets, they were driven with a follower, which means that the vibratory hammer could stay above the water level, and the follower was actually uh, grabbing the, the sheet piles and driving them underwater. So there are a lot of possibilities if you want to 
uh, increase the depth of the uh, deck on pass, for instance. Breakwaters are sometimes built with sheet paths, so it can be a double wall structure where we have a double wall, so a combined wall, for instance, with one or two levels of anchors, or what is most of the time done for uh, are to use cellular structures where you have uh, circular cells. So here you don't need any anchors, no railings, etc., and it's an auto-stable structure, so uh, ideal for this type of situations. You have to backfill with a good soil, so granular soil, but as I already said, you don't need to penetrate into the soil so that much. And if you have the bed rock, which is quite shallow, it's also a quite good solution. So one example in Indonesia, where they built a 1.7 kilometer long breakwater with circular cells with a diameter of about 20 meters. Uh, as I said, so up to 25, 30 meters, that's the maximum diameter that uh, can be achieved. And the sheet pads were up to 26 meter long, which is already quite a long length for this type of structures because the, stru the sheet pads don't have any uh, stiffness. So for flood protection and containment systems, there is one way to do it. Um, this is the cross section, uh, which is not necessarily the best one, so the one that we would recommend. If you are building something into the water, you can't deliver wall, we don't recommend. So you will need at least an anchor or a strut, something like this, to retain the, the soil the, and the water. And if you have a river embankment like here and you want to strengthen it or to make it impervious, so the core should be impervious, rather than using a clay layer, you can also use sheet pallets and this will increase the stability of the river embankment. And sometimes what happens is that it stays above, like you'll see on one of the next pictures. So it will increase the height. So here it's an embankment. And because it's in the middle of a, a, um, a city, they don't, didn't have enough space to increase the width of the embankment. So what they did is they increased, they have the sheet pads that are standing outside. And you see also coating on the one side, which is visible. And on the water side, it, it's not coated. On the other side, on this picture, you see uh, an embankment where they are driving the sheet pass and here they could drive up to 20 meters, per, no, sorry, 20 double pass per, per day. And it's simply to strengthen the riverbank for this flood protection. Erosion control and storm protection. So this is a nice uh, project uh, where we also supply the sheet pass after storm, the um, existing uh, retaining structures that were here, they were concrete and also old sheet pass, they uh, failed and then they rebuilt the whole structure with sheet pass, so a very, very interesting project. And um, they were also coated, as you can see here. And you see the sheet pass on the beach, and you see also the water that comes. So it protects also um, the foundations from the erosion because some of the houses were built very, very close to the sea. Another way to protect the beaches are groins. So in the end of the 90s in France, in this uh, Caillou sur Mer, which is a small village, they built 80 uh, groins. And um, in 2014, 2015, they built another 20 to extend the, um, the surface. And they were like 80 to 90 meters long and they go into the water. Well, Caillou sur Mer is in the marsh where you have about 10 to 30 meters of tidal, um, uh, extreme tidal. So th this means that at a certain point, the water comes up to here. And when the tidal is down, uh, you have a very long beach. And due to the currents and to the waves, the soil or the sand was being washed away. So they used um, gravel, but uh, as you can see here, and also these uh, grinds to protect the erosion. So th this is a picture of the installation. We supplied also very short piles, I mean from 3.8 up to 10 meters, which is relatively short, but yet you don't need longer piles. So it was very uh, cost effective and uh, the installation was also very rapid. Now, if we talk about excavation pits, that's probably the most um, the most cheap piles that are used for temporary go to excavation pits. So you can have it with one, two or three strut levels. You have to check the soil conditions, of course. And there are some alternatives, like you see it on the right sketch. So you can pour the concrete uh, slab underwater, which means that you can save 
on the length of the piles, but also on the deformation. And the other thing that's interesting is very often those are small um, projects where you can actually get sheet piles from stock. So in that case, you have to analyze uh, based on the availability from the stock material or from rental pool or also from what the contractor has on his own uh, pool. If one solution is better than the other, if you have to deliver quite fast. Now, if you have enough space, you can also reduce the active pressure on the sheet pile wall. So here by installing, well, by excavating a berm. Cantilever walls are also sometimes used. And in this case, it's the same principle. So if you do a concrete slab, which is poured underwater, you can also reduce the length of the pile. But cantilever walls have one disadvantage, is the deflection at the top. Or if you have um, a very wide, excavation, what you can do is also excavate with a slope and then install these struts with a rate, so a rate strut. And in that case, you can do it in a different phase. You can first excavate in the middle and then partially in different steps, go uh, and install these uh, struts before you excavate actually to the final elevation here and pour the final slab here. So those are different ways to do it. For cover dams in the water, Cantilever walls are rarely used because you have always some dynamic actions being for from the current or from the waves from small boats or vessels that pass. So always prefer either with the struts or with this other solution. So one uh, sorry, one thing that you have to be very careful about these coffer dams in the water are if you have an unbalanced coffer dam. So you have to make sure that the pressure from one side is almost the same as from the other like you do it here on, with the method A or method B, or you make sure that one of the, anch one of the sheet pile walls is anchored with tie rods on anchorage so that this sheet pile is the one which is anchored and then the other one can be strutted against this one. So this is, in my opinion, the best method to do it. It's not the one that's used the most often, but it's, in my opinion, the best one. Now you can also build tunnels and bridges with sheet piles, permanent ones. So for a tunnel normally it's very simple. You have a slab, you have the sheet piles, you can transfer also the vertical loads to the sheet pile wall, which can transfer it to the soil. You might have to increase it a little bit because of the vertical loads if you compare it only to a retaining wall. And for underground car parks, it's the same principle with the difference that you have slabs that can be used as uh, struts. So you have to um, analyze the sequence because you need temporary struts and then you have to build a um, you have to build the slabs, but this is something that's quite common in the Netherlands, for instance. They build um, one or two underground car parks with shield sheet piles uh, almost every month. Nice picture of one of those underground car parks in the Netherlands. You see here the architect didn't want it coated, but at the entrance gate, uh, the sheet piles were coated with a gray, uh, which is not, well, not that. Uh, attractive, but uh, that was a solution that the architect wanted. But here we have three levels of underground car parks, which is quite an achievement, especially because the water table is very, very high. And then a um, much older project, which was built also in, executed in India, in Kolkata, where um, a retaining wall, a permanent retaining wall with the AZ26 was built. So you have two levels, uh, quite interesting, also built in the middle of the city. Um, vibrations and so on, noise are always one of those concerns. So a few pictures of uh, bridges and tunnels. So a very small bridge abutment for a pedestrian bridge. And then on the other side, you have a tunnel, which is relatively long. It's uh, close to the airport in Santos in Brazil. And here they use the method which we call top down. So they built, so first they installed the sheet pass, so they drove the sheet pass into the ground. Then they built the upper um, slab on the ground and then once they had connected the slab to the sheet pass they started excavating below which takes a little bit more time but on the other side the roundabout that you have above it could already be opened for the circulation and this in um, in this situation was a big advantage because um, you could actually only you had only to stop the circulation only a few weeks so a small break with the video And then I'll come back.
Okay. I'm back. Good. So, if we go to the next slide, um, here I have um, a few sketches of the failure mechanisms that can happen with the uh, retaining walls. This is valid for sheet pads, but also for other types of um, retaining walls. I mean, the first one is the insufficient embedment depth, like you see it here. It will rotate around the, the toe. And the other thing is if you have an anchored wall, um, it might rotate around the anchor if you don't have sufficient uh, embedment depth. So those are the failure modes that have, of course, to be uh, prevented. Uh, and you have to check that the embedment is sufficient and also a safety on the passive resistance to make sure that it doesn't happen. The other thing is very often, um, at least on the designs, that the length of the tie rod is not sufficient so that the anchor is actually not far away from the main wall to support it. So this is also something that has to be prevented. But what happens most of the time is either a failure of the tie rod, like you see here, because the loads are much higher than expected, or even worse, a failure of the whaler system. This can be the plates, this can be the bolts, this can be the whaler. And this is, uh, happened a couple of times and quite curious because a lot of time people want to save some money on these whalers or bolts and things like this on the plates, but they pay a lot of money for the rest, for the anchors, for the tie rods, for the sheet pads. And due to these um, small savings, you can have a failure. And of course, this is something that uh, we try to prevent. Deep-seated failure of the total retaining complex or the Bishop method, for instance, this is something that has to be checked for all the situations. But usually, if you have sufficient embedment, normally the, this uh, failure does not occur, at least in most of the soil conditions. The other failure would be of the sheet pile itself. So if you have a sheet pile and you don't have the rotation failure of the soil, but the bending moment is way too high, then you can um, form a plastic hinge. And then, of course, you have a failure. You can do the same. It can happen the same to an anchored wall, but then the bending moment would be maximum around this position. And then you can have a deformation, a plastic hinge. However, plastic hinge does not mean that it's uh, a failure because it, it could actually stop at a certain moment if um, you don't go too far away. But of course, you can calculate with it, but you have to prevent the, this type of failure. So from the geotechnical design, just a few words because it would take uh, too much time uh, to get into the details, but a few things uh, which are really very important when you design a sheet pile wall uh, to prevent such a failure as you can see here. Yeah, the, the problem was that the soil was so bad and that the calculation showed that you need an anchor, but the contractor didn't want to put an anchor. So they tried without an anchor and finally, at the end, it failed. So they had to recover the sheet pass, which was possible, redrive them and then put an anchor. So the geometry normally, you don't have that much of an influence. Your technical soil parameters, you don't have that much of an influence. And the environmental parameters are things that come from the nature. So water levels, loads, including ice loads, but I think in, in India, ice loads are not a big issue. And then, of course, seismic. So seismic loading is getting more and more um, important because even though it, they are in some countries only very small, they have a big influence on the results. Service life, of course, because you have to define how long the structure has to uh, be there, so to resist. And normally for key walls, it's uh, anything between 35 and 50 years. For bridge abutments, it goes up to 100 years. And for temporary structures, only a few months, up to two or three years. And then, of course, the visibility restrictions, like the deflection or deformation, quite important. You have to define that because otherwise you might have some uh, issues at the job site. One thing that you have to consider about uh, retaining structure is that the soil is, in fact, acting as a loading and as a supporting element. So it's both things at the same time. It's a combination of soil structure and steel structure. So you have an interaction between both of them. And the soil conditions usually vary along the sheet pile wall and also the height. So the soil strat stratification normally is not horizontal, even though in most of the designs you will assume that's horizontal. 
Again, very important is that the soil properties can change under certain conditions like seismic, like the influence of the water, consolidation, or if you compact, it can also be modified on purpose in order to improve a, a backfill, for instance, you can compact. And then we distinguish three different categories. The first one is the granular soil with sand and gravel. So the important parameter is the internal friction angle. It doesn't have any cohesion, sometimes a little bit. It's a very good backfill material, which is not the case for cohesive soils like silt or clay. Silt can be used sometimes, but it's not the best one. It has a very low inner friction angle. Sometimes we assume it to be zero, but it has a cohesion. It has a cohesion undrained and drained. And then you have to be careful also about um, analyzing both situations, so undrained and drained. It shrinks sometimes, and as I said, it's poor material for backfill. And then you have what we call organic soils, which, um, well, you have to cope with it. For instance, in the Netherlands, they have peat over a couple of meters at the shallow depths, so they have to deal with it because they cannot uh, simply replace it. But sometimes when you have the choice to replace it or to improve it, that's what you would be doing rather than uh, coping with the bad soil parameters. So not only for the design, you have to determine a specific weight, humid and submerged, the cohesion, undrained and co um, drained, the friction angle and the soil stiffness if you want to use um, soil structure interaction method to calculate the bending moments. Important also is the wall frictions that we call delta A and delta P, the delta A being the wall friction on the active side and delta P on the passive side. And then how to determine Ka and Kph. There are different ways and methods to do it. But very important, I think, and I would like to uh, emphasize on that, is the geotechnical investigation. The site investigation will have a big influence on the optimization factors because if you know, uh, if you have a very good knowledge about the soil properties, about the stratification, about the levels of the water, then you can really optimize. If you don't have this type of information, like here, for instance, uh, where you have only three or four borings and you have to interpolate in between, you might have to be more careful about the selection of the parameters and the position of the layers because, as you see, they can vary. So um, there is a recommendation from the German Waterfront Committee, which uh, is called EAU, in which they uh, suggest to make every 50 meters what they call principal boreholes, and in between, also boreholes, uh, not necessarily with the testing of the material, but at least to make sure that you have um, the you, you, you get a feeling about the layers and also the material, and don't miss something like you, you could if you have only a few borings. But also to make these borings in front of the key wall, at the center of the key wall, and also behind, because this will give you a um, kind of a 3D. Um, information about the, um, the soil. And even though it's normal for, well, for the big projects, for smaller projects, very often it is not done. So how to determine the Ka and the Kp, which is the active and the passive, there are different ways. Very often the Coulomb method, so the formula from Coulomb is used for Ka and for Kp, but if you have a very high friction angle, like a phi of 35 degrees, it might give you a Kp which is too high. So for the passive earth resistance, normally what we recommend is to use the um, tables from Kako Kerizel or Kerizel at sea, it's almost the same, which give you a, a good approximation, which is not as optimistic as a Coulomb for the very high friction angles, but if you have a fee of 30, for instance, you'll get almost the same value. And the difference is only the, um, the failure surface. So Coulomb assumes that you have a straight line, whereas the Kako Kerizel assumes that you have a straight line combined with a logarithmical spiral, which gives a different solution. Now, once you have this Ka and Kp, you can determine the, well, you can determine the vertical pressure at a certain point of the soil. You can determine the horizontal pressure to, due to the soil, due to the water, due to the surcharge loads on the active and on the passive side. And you can also take into account the cohesion. There are different formulas, so I won't go into the details, but this is the one that uh, we use normally in in Germany, where you reduce the active pressure uh, when you have a cohesion, and where you increase the passive pressure if you have a cohesion, you multiply the square root of the K with 2 and you add it. Now, you know also that in order to achieve this full active or full passive pressure, you need a deformation of the soil. So on the active side, it's only like a 
0.1% of the height, but on the passive side, you need much more. So here in the sketch, you see that's 5% approximately of the height. And this means that, in fact, you don't achieve or you should not, well, in reality, it doesn't uh, happen like uh, um, these limit equilibrium methods, but you have a soil structure interaction, which means that here you have almost a full active pressure, but it produces at the top, at the tip, because here the soil does not uh, deform that much, and the same on the passive side, where you have uh, the full passive, and then at a certain point you don't get it. So you have to make sure that also you get a safety factor. So uh, that's the difference between the theoretical and the effective. So you have to make sure that you have a, a sufficient safety factor, so you have to increase either the length of the pile, or you have to reduce the passive resistance by a safety factor that depends on the methods that can be used. So there are a few softwares uh, around the world. Um, in Europe, in the Netherlands, for instance, uh, a lot of people use the day sheet and Plaxis, the final elements. Uh, we have it also. So uh, Plaxis is more for very complex structures or when the deformation is very important. And the interesting thing about it is that you really see, as you can see it here on this case, the failure mechanism and the failure surface for this specific uh, case. Now we have also a software which is called AM Retain. You can have a look uh, on our website. It's based on the subgrade reaction model. It's also, you can do the calculation according to bureau codes. There are three different approaches and uh, according to the allowable stress design, which is uh, the old method that was used. And you can also determine the distance, the required distance between the head wall and the anchor wall. So this is quite interesting and quite handy. So once you have determined the bending moments and the shear forces in uh, your pile, you have to choose the correct pile. And this is what we will do in the next uh, slides. Just to show you that there are three different methods uh, to calculate uh, if you have a cantilever wall, if you have an anchored wall. Uh, I'm not talking about um, two anchors or more complex structures. So the cantilever wall is the wall that will have the longest length. So here it will be a relatively long and a very high moment and very high deflections, but you don't have any anchors. So it, you have to check if an anchored wall would be better because here you have to install the tie rods and the anchor wall, but you have a smaller um, sheet by wall and smaller bending moments. And on the other side, the minimum embedment that you require here is the free earth support. This means that you have a bending moment M1, which is a little bit higher than here for the fixed earth, but lower than for the cantilever. So this means that for, so for retaining walls up to eight meters with U piles up to 10 meters or 12 meters with Z piles, this is typically the solutions that we'll have a look at, except as I showed in Denmark, where they can go a little bit deeper if you install a second anchor below water. So, to determine the minimum embedment depth for the free air support, it's relatively simple. I won't go into the details, but normally you choose the tip elevation. It's an iterative process. And then you take the moment about the support until you reach equilibrium. So you have to check different um, embedment depths. And once you have that, you simply check, uh, you calculate the reaction at the anchor. And then from that, you can determine the shear force and the moment. So it's relatively easy. but a little bit time consuming if you do it by hand. So some tips, for instance, also in the EAU, what they propose is to shorten each second pile by one meter without having to do any calculation. So you could have one pile which is 19 meters and the second one 20 meters, and it would not reduce the safety factor uh, for this type of um, solution. I remember very well from my professor at university, what he said is that water is the worst enemy of the geotechnical engineer, and it's the case, especially for retaining walls. So it can act with its full pressure, so you don't have any reduction. You may have heard of the reduction from rho that is used in the United States, for instance, but water, you don't have any reduction. It might be an artesian under pressure. You, you have to take into account buoyancy, piping effects, different water levels, the current, erosion, um, and also, a chemical composition which might have an influence on durability. Some waters are more corrosive than other ones. And then also the amount of water that percolates into the uh, excavation. 
a little bit of theoretical aspects. Oh, I think I. Well, yes. So this is the summary of uh, what I explained. So you have to determine the embedment, the elevation of the anchors. You can also play with that. That's the, mainly the parameters that you have an influence. So the embedment depth and the position of the anchors and the number of anchors or struts. And then you do uh, an iteration you, until you find the most cost effective solution. Once you have that, you have to select um, a sheet pile wall. The sheet pile wall will have a small influence on the um, deformation if you take a subgrade reaction module. But if you take a LEM, then it doesn't have an influence. So the elastic section modulus is one of the parameters and the um, yield strength, which you can influence. So you have to choose. And then you have the moment of inertia, important for the deformation, section area, and so on, and so on. The elastic section modulus is a feature of the um, sheet pile. It depends only on the geometry. So this is something that you can find in the brochures from the manufacturers. And the yield strength is also something that you can choose. So today uh, you can um, have yield strengths from 240 up to 430 and 460. And you can choose this one. And then what you have to make sure is also um, the, um, the optimization. So for the sheet piles, for instance, you have a section modules from 1200 up to 5000. If you take a Z pile up to 3300 with the U pile, and for the combined wall systems, you can go up to 46000, which is huge, but you have also a relatively um, heavy solution. So you have to find the optimum by combining the elastic section modules or the plastic with the steel grade. So we can supply according to the European standard, which is EN 10 to 48. Can also supply according to ASTM. Nowadays, S355 GP would be the standard steel grade, but as we'll see, using um, higher steel grade will actually reduce the amount of uh, steel that you need. So it, even though you have to pay maybe a little bit more because of the hours that uh, the manufacturer has to put into the steel grade to achieve this uh, yield strength, the solution will be cheaper. And then we have M local, but I will come back to that later. So if you look, sorry at uh, this comparison where you have a bending moment capacity that you want to achieve and then depending on the yield strength that increases you see that the bending moment that you need re is reduced and if you look at the weight so for a 355 you need a sheet pile which is about 214 kilograms per square meter and if you take a 430 you can reduce it to an az 36700 m which is around 100, 170 kilograms per square meter. So this is a change a reduction of about 20% simply by increasing the steel grade. So as I said, the more cost-effective solution is normally achieved with a higher steel grade. However, you have to check drivability because we have seen also people that use um, very light piles but very long and then it might be more difficult to drive them. So as I said, the parameter that you can influence is the embedment depth. And of course, if you change that, you will also change the bending moment. And then it's, again, an iterative process in order to get the best option. So in Europe, in the past, we used the uh, allowable stress method with a global safety factor. But nowadays, it's uh, the formula that you see here, where we have partial safety factors, which are the gamma M0, and then reduction factors that take into account specific features like for U-piles uh, where you can have to uh, use these reduction factors. And in the United States, um, they used also uh, reduction factors, but they made the distinction between usual loading, unusual, and extreme. And even in France, for instance, they make the distinction between temporary and permanent, so they don't use the same safety factor if it's a temporary structure or if it's a permanent structure. But in, important is not to mix the, the, the methods. So an, an interesting thing about the new Euro codes is the classification. So uh, sheet pads are classified in class one, two, three, or four. It's like in the United States, like compact, semi-compact. And if you have a class one or two, you can use the plastic section modules and with the same formula instead of the elastic section modules. And this is quite interesting because the difference of um, the plastic um, elastic, no, the plastic compared to the elastic can be up to 25%. So this means that the just switching to um, the new Euro code, you could save up to 25% on um, a sheet pile wall. Now, if you 
Compare also u paths, the narrower and the wider ones. This is an example with the GU16400, and for the same section properties, and even the AU16 has a higher uh, bending moment capacity, you can reduce the mass of the steel, so the quantities that you need by 35%, but this is not only for the mass that you buy, but also for the transport, you have less um, mass to transport, and also for the driving, you might actually use a lighter equipment to drive those sheet paths. So if I summarize, there are a few parameters, so the sheet pile length, the sheet pile type, as we have seen, and then the steel grade. And this is what uh, you have to choose in order to uh, verify the steel stresses. You have also to take into account durability, as you'll see, and insulation. So this is a chart that you can find in the piling handbook, where you see for the soil conditions, so easy, normal, or hard driving, the length of the pile that's recommended um, compared to the elastic section model. So it, it gives you an indication. It's not like a, a rocket science, but it's uh, based on experience. If you want to reuse paths, then we have also developed this U-type paths with the reinforced shoulders, which are better for reusing. So if you think about reusing, maybe uh, think about these special paths that uh, are the PU18, PU22, and PU28. And environmental impact, but that's another story uh, that we'll deal with in um, another webinar. Durability is important because steel corrodes, you know that. It corrodes more in fresh water and in seawater than in the soil. So in the soil, like you can see it here, in 50 years, in undisturbed natural soils, in 50 years, the loss of steel would be about 0.6 meters, millimeters, sorry. And in the splash zone, it would be about 3.75. Now, if you look at the different ways to deal with it, it's quite uh, there are different solutions, so you can increase the thickness, you can increase the steel grade, you can protect the steel, you can use cathodic protection, which works very well in the in the waters in the water, and you can also use a capping beam down to minus one, so that you will protect the portion which is the most corroded here by with the concrete. Uh, there is also this AM loco, which is more corrosion, more resistant in the permanent immersion zone and in the low water zone. Uh, it reduces actually by a factor of five or a factor of three, but it's only available for specific uh, sheet paths like the AZ sections here. And then if I go to the next slide, okay, how to determine this, the reduced section properties if you select uh, this. Um, to uh, assume that the sheet pile will uh, corrode. So you have these graphs from the manufacturers and then you select the sheet pile and how much uh, thickness you lose and then it gives you an approximate reduced section properties. So this is again a summary. It's an iterative process. You design the sheet pile wall, you choose a section, you estimate the loss of the steel thickness, you determine the reduced elastic section properties and then you check if the remaining thickness is the same because the flange thickness and the web thickness is not always the same. So this is an iteration that you can do. We have also a software that can simplify, simplify this task uh, quite handy, also based on Eurocodes and a lot of stresses. And it has also the database for the corrosion rate from Eurocode 3.5, so the table that I showed to you. And uh, a simple example, again, with the permanent immersion zone and the natural soils where you lose overall 2.35 millimeters and then you take a steel weight with a yield strength of 430 MPa, you go into the catalogs and then you choose the ones that might uh, be um, sufficient, so where you have a sufficient safety factor, and then you see that depending on the pile that you choose, so this is the new range which is 800 millimeters wide, there is a big difference in the mass. So from 138 up to 157, that's again approximately 15% that you can save by using the most adequate sheet pile. Another thing that you have to take into account if you want to reuse the sheet pile is that you can damage the sheet pile. So this means that you should buy piles that are a little bit longer so that if you damage the top or the tip, you can cut them off and reuse them at the same job site. And a difference between hot rod and cold foam. So I said most of it, I think that more than 90% are hot rod, but they're also cold foam sheet paths. And the main difference is the thicknesses and the interlocks, as you can see. So the interlock of the cold foam is not as watertight as the interlocks of the hot rod. And also the limit, uh, the yield strength 
normally they are limited to 355. So as a, as a summary, pay attention to the geotechnical investigation. If you spend a little bit more money on the geotechnical investigation, you can really optimize the other uh, designs. So we prefer to have a good geotechnical investigation rather than having to make uh, too conservative assumptions. And then the optimization is an iterative process. We recommend to use high strength steel grades or special steels like AM or local in order to optimize that. And then again, for temporary or permanent applications, in some countries you can use different safety factors and also for the service life, and the durability, you can calculate the reduced section properties or you can protect um, with coatings or with a cathodic protection, but you have to check which is the most uh, cost-effective solution. And also, if you are uh, building something more um, uh, for temporary or small uh, excavation or small keywall or something like this, you can also check if they have uh, this material on um, stock because then in, rather than trying to optimize, you will start from this material and this length and try to find out if you need one anchor, two length anchors or, or things like this under what the concrete slab and things like this. So, but overall, we believe that um, with steel sheet pads, you can build very cost effective and environmental friendly solutions. Thank you very much. I think this was my last slide. Thank you, sir. Uh, it was a wonderful presentation. Uh, we thank Ashlar Metal, uh, the sponsor for this uh, webinar session. Uh, if any other organization would like to sponsor uh, the upcoming webinar series, uh, you may please contact DFA in their office. So now we will view the sponsorship video, promotion videos. ArcelorMittal's Z-Type Sheet Piling Series is especially suitable for building reliable structures in a quick and cost-efficient manner. The optimized geometry of the Z-Profile leads to superior section properties compared to other types. Steel sheet piles are used worldwide for the construction of key walls and breakwaters in harbors locks and bank reinforcement along rivers and canals, not forgetting efficient flood protection systems. Additional applications are temporary cofferdams on land and in water, permanent bridge abutments, retaining walls for underpasses, or underground car parks and impervious containment walls. As the world's leader of hot-rolled steel sheet piles and as the operator of the world's most innovative sheet pile rolling mill in Belval, Luxembourg, ArcelorMittal not only supplies sheet piles, bearing piles and steel tubes for foundations, but provides complete foundation solution packages including fabricated special piles, coated piles, anchor material and accessories. Our engineers and sales managers have been sharing their knowledge and expertise with customers all over the world for more than 100 years. With its ongoing commitment to research and development, ArcelorMittal makes it a priority to constantly improve the performance, quality, durability and cost efficiency of its sheet piling systems. Substantial investments in the Belval rolling mill in Luxembourg now allow for the production of wider and lighter piles. The brand new AZ800 range combines improvements in the structural quality of the sheet piles with technical innovations in production, thus paving the way for a faster, more competitive and value-creating solution. ArcelorMittal Sheet Piling Connecting Pioneers
best thing about the Deep Foundations Institute is the collection of engineers, contractors, material and equipment suppliers, and academics. And so bringing everybody together means the stuff that we get done is useful and is immediately applied and is not in some out there academic corner or it's not promotional to one type versus the other. It's really a true collection of, of the best of this industry. Membership of the DFI has many benefits, as I said. Um, there's, for the younger members particularly, there's a wealth of knowledge um, within the DFI's uh, archives, if you will. The magazines, the journals, uh, the publications. We have this uh, organization called One Mind that we subscribe to, where there are literally thousands of documents on all aspects of deep foundation construction, design, etc. Um, so from that point of view, it's, it's a, a very, very important resource. Um, that comes free with your membership. Learning about technical advancements, uh, again, seeing what projects people are up to and what solutions other engineering firms have come up with, and then the networking opportunities that we get um, in the, at the in-person meetings like this conference. I think the technical committees are is just another great way to get involved in DFI. Uh, you meet a lot of, you know, people in the people in the industry that are very uh, influential and important uh, they make a lot of decisions that we uh, you know live by in the industry so uh, when you participate in a committee like that you can see firsthand how how uh, design and construction is kind of sculpted so it's it's a uh, it's a lot of fun and uh, it's a worthwhile investment it's an organization basically that uh, guides not only the principles of what transpires in the Deep Foundation Institute or industry, but also um, brings everybody together to discuss common problems and provide solutions. Uh, now we'll step into the question and answer session. I welcome Ms. Amruta uh, uh, to take over the session, to coordinate with the speaker regarding questions. Uh, we don't hear you. No, I, I'm what I, I don't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. So uh, I was uh, just going through the questions and thanks DFI again. So the first question I would uh, take is uh, from uh, Jamin Vaidya. Thank you for the question. Uh, what the question is, if we designed anchor sheet pile as per limit equilibrium method and FA method, say in plexus, there's going to be variations in bending moments. So up to what percentage of variations are to be allowed between the two methods of design? Java, please. Yeah, but th that's a good question. But uh, unfortunately, uh, there is no real answer because um, there are two completely different methods. And in fact, the limit equilibrium method is a good one for preliminary of uh, very simple structures. Or, but um, Plaxis normally, when we use it and most of the engineers use them, it's for very specific applications where deflections can be uh, an issue or where the soils are not um, very well known or very high structures. So when you really need to fine tune a lot of stuff because it takes also a lot more time. And we have made some comparisons uh, between the limit equilibrium method, between the SSIM uh, with AM Retain or with the Rideau and between Plaxis. And usually if you uh, play a little bit with the, some parameters between the SSIM and between the Plaxis, you'll get about a difference of 
um, and, and more. But up to 20% normally it's something which is acceptable and most of the time Plaxis will give uh, lower bending moments than the SSIM. But for limited equilibrium methods it really depends, well I haven't done it in, in detail here, maybe we, we should go in, in a, another webinar, but um, the way you put the safety will have a big influence. So um, a lot, um, I would say that um, almost 10, 20 years ago there was a, an analysis that was done here in, uh, in Europe between different countries and professors from universities and in fact um, they did the same design, they did the design of the same structure but based on their um, on their experience and on their local regulations and the bending moment varied up to twice. So some of them had the bending moment from the minimum to the maximum, there was a factor of two, which is huge. I mean, but it's not the only thing that you have to consider because you have also to consider the safety factors and you don't, should not mix the different um, methods because you might have a higher bending moment in one country, but if the safety factor is lower, then it can offset the difference. So I think this is what has to be, uh, why you have to be very careful. So I think we'll uh, go to uh, the next question. Um, uh, the question is from Mr. E.A. Khan from LNT. So um, there are a couple of questions actually. One question is uh, how are stiffnesses in the wall model in the software worked out? The second uh, is what are the standard available, standards available for corrosion rate determination? I think it was covered, but probably you would want to clarify once more, uh, job. Okay, and the first one was? First, how are the stiffnesses in the wall model in the software worked out? How to model, um, how to model the module from the soil, correct? Um, yeah. Yes, um, that's again one of those uh, very, very critical aspects of uh, the soil structure interaction, either with the Plexis or with uh, another software. It's that you have to make an assumption. So in some countries you will find uh, a method that uh, proposes um, a formula uh, which is based on their experience. I'm thinking here about uh, France for instance and then uh, based on the soil investigation that you have and on the soil properties uh, that you have from the laboratory tests you can estimate a specific soil module to take into account in the modelization. However, some are valid for very stiff walls and others are for flexible walls. So what we do is we use a very simple method, uh, a very simple chart, which was developed by Chadesson. And this gives relatively good results if you compare to the measurements that were done in the job sites. And for the corrosion rates, uh, maybe I didn't um, mention it, so the corrosion rates that I showed you from the table are from Eurocode 3 part 5. This is, um, these tables are based on investigations that were done here in uh, Europe a long time ago, uh, in the 80s and 90s, and those are average values. So it does not mean that uh, in every port in Europe it will be the same, but it gives you an estimation of how much uh, corrosion you might have um, after a certain period. So it was measured over 25 years and the rest has been extrapolated. Now we know also that in countries where the temperatures are higher or in specific, uh, uh, how would I say it, in specific environmental zones like uh, very humid or things like this, corrosion might be a little bit higher. So what we do for instance for uh, Middle East is that we increase those values by a certain factor which is 20, 30, 50 percent depends on the environment. Okay, uh, so uh, I probably take the next question from Mr. Mohamed Azari. He is a chief engineer of Coast Lady Development Corporation in the state of Kerala. So I'll read out the question for you, John. Uh, what was the reason for adopting the 20 meter dry breakwater in Indonesia? Was it a design requirement or availability of sheet pile material, uh, like the section properties? Like what was the specific reason why the circular cell was adopted in, uh, in Indonesia? Um, I, I would have to, to check, but um, 
for this specific project. But uh, generally speaking, the, the installation of a circular cell is a little bit more complex than of um, a regular double wall. However, it is something that uh, you can do with uh, one single uh, template in this case, because they had all the same uh, diameter. And the thing is that it's also a very long structure. So if you have a long structure, I think long structure for me for circular cells is something around 200 meters and above, then it gets a competitive against a double wall. And the double wall, the um, difficulty is that you have to drive them deep into the ground. And usually for such a depth, you might need two anchor levels. And installing an anchor level below water might be more difficult. So it's kind of a, um, an analysis of the contractor and also of the design engineer, what uh, will be the, the best optimum also for the installation, not only for the design. It's clear that the uh, design of a um, double wall with a HZM system, for instance, it's easier because you have a symmetrical uh, uh, wall. But for the circular cells, I think here for the breakwater, and also I didn't show it, but uh, we have also a, a very nice example of a breakwater in um, Costa, Costa Rica, so in, uh, in the Americas, where they used also very uh, well circular cells rather than a double wall. Okay, so uh, there is again a question from uh, Mr. H. S. Uh, Thomas from our technical department in uh, in Kerala. So the question is, how much base resistance can we? Ex Sorry, the question is, um, uh, how reliable is the Monocarbe method for cough dams, or is there a better way? How reliable is Monocarbe? Monocarbe okay. So did I understand correctly? Yes. Um, you want me to see the question? No, no. So, how reliable is uh, mononobial cabin method for cover dams? Um, I think that so it's concerned seismic, uh, if I understand correctly. And the, um, for um, mononobial cabin has been developed well mainly for gravity structures and. Um, we know by now, and I think that uh, in the next uh, webinar, so on the, uh, on the next uh, on webinar the number two, my colleague will talk about it more in detail. Um, we have investigated and to check if mononobi okabe is a good solution for sheet pile walls, for flexible structures, because a sheet pile wall is a flexible structure except the circular cells. And we have found out that there are different ways or other ways to design a sheet pile in the seismic region than using simply monolobial KB because in some cases the increase or the difference between the methods that we uh, will present and the methods from monolobial KB can be up to 50% and even more. So there's a, a huge difference in the bending moments that you can get from these new methods. I call it new methods, it's nothing really new, but it's a new approach compared to monolobial KB. But it's sure that monolobial KB would be on the safe side, but very high bending moments and also very high deflections if you do it like this. Okay, so there are a couple of questions on deflection. So I'll, I'll generalize the questions for you. So uh, yeah. the question goes like this. May I know the allowable deflection for sheet piles and what is the allowable deflection in AU sheet piles? To not affect interlocking of the sheet pile while there is a uh, deflection? Uh, very good question and um, we have had um, a big discussion here in, uh, in the past month uh, about that uh, with a geotechnical engineer, a very renowned one, and it really depends on the application. For instance, if you have an excavation close to um, foundations that are sensitive, like foundations from a high-rise building. In that case, you would want to reduce the maximum allowable deflection to, let's say, 20 to 50 millimeters. So this is really very strict um, and it is feasible with sheet piles, but um, it might be too conservative. So, I mean, of course, if you have uh, sensitive foundations, uh, close to the excavation, you have to be careful and 50 millimeters seems to be uh, something acceptable. If you have a retaining wall or if you have a key wall, 
uh, where you have 15 meters of depth and the deformation is about 20 centimeters or 25 or even more, the steel will cope with it. I mean, you will not have any declutching. You will be able, uh, it will not fail. So those are things that um, uh, you can achieve with the steel. And now for AU shippers, for instance, there is no limit in itself um, because in fact what happens, and this is something that uh, was tested um, also in, in the Netherlands <clears throat> a long time ago, is that the sheet pad will fail through this plastic hinge before it will actually uh, break uh, the interlock. So I think that um, it's an interesting uh, way of analyzing it, but uh, the, the interlock itself is not the one which is going to fail. So. It's really the deflection, and as I said, uh, at ultimate limit state, I don't remember, well, I would have probably said it, at ultimate limit state, you can go to a uh, plastic hinge, but in fact, knowing that in reality, due to the safety factors, you will never achieve this. And there's also a method um, in Denmark to design the sheet pile walls, where they get very short sheet piles and very light piles, where they accept this plastic hinge in the calculations, ultimate limit state, but in fact, it will never reach this plastic hinge. Okay, so there are a couple of questions on installation of sheet pile, which I think I'll club it for you. First is, um, what are the criteria for selecting the right hammer? And another is, uh, there must be some minimum thickness specified for corresponding or specific length of the pile so that they don't bend or buckle during installation. Um, yes, so this is also something which depends a lot on the experience and on the soil conditions, on the local soil conditions, because for instance, in the Netherlands, they have, well, they use, I think it's more than 100,000 tons a year of sheet pan, so they drive into very soft soils and with a lot of, um, um, a lot of uh, driving equipment, so vibratory hammers, presses, uh, impact hammers, and they have like a database where all the contractors have contributed so that um, when you want to go to a specific uh, location, a uh, city or uh, location, so a key wall, and then you go into this database and you know, okay, this contractor has used this type of hammer with this type of sheet pile and it was successful or they had problems. So also that's a good thing. But there are some formulas, um, very simple formulas, which give you kind of an overview of what could be done. And then what we always recommend, and there will be a webinar also on installation, is that um, you contact the experts from the manufacturer. So they have also a lot of experience. They have this software that can be used and they can tell you, okay, for this type of sheet pile, in this type of soil, I would recommend uh, this type of equipment, be it a hammer or a vibratory hammer. Well, Generally speaking, if you want to drive into a clay layer, which is very compact or very stiff, you would go with an impact hammer. And if you try to drive into soft or into granular soils like um, sands, vibratory hammer is much faster and cost effective. So it's cheaper, you get done much faster also. But sometimes what you also have to do is you simply start with the vibratory hammer until you get to refusal or stop, you cannot penetrate anymore, and then you switch to another um, equipment like an impact hammer. But this is, of course, will depend on the um, job. If it's a big job, you can have two different equipments. If it's a small job, of course, you might not have the possibility to have that, or you don't have this type of uh, hammer available in the country. So um, there are some formulas. If you look in our filing handbook that you can download from our website, you will find these uh, very simple formulas for the vibratory hammer and for the impact hammers, but this is just to have an idea. I would not say that uh, you should um, blindly use those formulas because um, as also in DFI, you have also this type of formula. So it is to be taken with a, a little bit of um, engineering judgment, uh, not simply using it. And for the thickness, yes, there are some thicknesses, minimum thickness that are recommended. If you look at the EAU, so the waterfront recommendations from the German uh, committee, they recommend a minimum 10 millimeters for everything that is in contact uh, with the salt water. So for all the key walls and all the um, jetties and so on, 
uh, all the sheet piles will have at least 10 millimeters. This is more for corrosion reasons and for installation. If you have um, um, a pressing machine, an equipment like a geek and press equipment, where you want to press the sheet piles into the ground, they have also their own recommendations and they prefer to have uh, Z piles or U piles with a minimum thickness of 10 millimeters because the weight of the machine that you put on, on this uh, sheet piles is so heavy or so big that uh, it would actually damage the sheet pile before you start driving. So those are kind of the, um, the, the, the general rules. There is one rule uh, that we have for the length of the pile, but this is relatively, uh, well, you have to be careful about it, but um, it means that the length of the pile in meters should be the um, elastic section modulus divided by 100. This means that um, if you have a sheet pile which is 10 meters, you should use at least um, uh, um, section with a thousand cubic centimeters per meter. If it's 20 meters, it should be at around 2,000 and things like this. So it gives you already an idea about the size. Uh, and that's also what I was saying, also about the length. For instance, there was a job site where people wanted to install an AZ-17, which uh, had a 31 meter length. And there we said, well, it might work, but the uh, probability is that uh, it will not work because the sheet is too flexible to be driven in this type of soil with this type of length. Okay, I think I'm running out of time and I'll take one last question and uh, all your questions which are not answered also, uh, we have uh, made a record and uh, we will make sure that all your questions are answered and it will be mailed from DFI. Uh, the last question is from Mr. Uh, Vedas from Afcon Infrastructure. Okay, so his question goes: um, Can a circular, single-level started cofferdam be analyzed in the same way as a 2D sheet pile model, but arranged in a circular manner? What are the additional forces other than hoop stresses subjected due to the circular nature of the retaining structure? Um, could you repeat it? Because I, I think repeat I will. It. I, it. <laughs> I will. Okay. Uh, can a circular single level started coffer dam be analyzed in the same way as a 2D sheet pile model, but arranged in a circular manner? What are the additional forces other than hoop stresses subjected due to circular nature of the retaining structure? Okay, so if I understand correctly, the, the question is, um, if you build a circular cofferdam uh, with a regular sheet pile, we're not talking about um, flat sheet piles, correct? So, uh, circular single level strutted cofferdam be analyzed in the same way as a 2D sheet pile model, but arranged in a circular manner. So I don't think the reference is to flat sheet yeah, piles, okay. but yeah. yeah. Well, that... that um, it's a good question um, because uh, it's not the first time we get the same question. It's um, it's a simplification that we make. So of course, if you have a circular uh, layout, um, and if the how would I say, if the radius is relatively small, you will have like a three-dimensional effect. So um, it will depend, in my opinion. No, I don't know. Please. The... Sorry. Uh, so, in, in my opinion, it will really depend on the um, on the circular on the on the radius or diameter of the cell, uh, because normally regular sheet piles like Z piles or U piles are not um, are not going to resist through hoop in the interlock. So this is something that you should avoid. But they have a certain resistance; they have a, even a, a quite high resistance. But normally, if the radius is relatively high, then the um, the, the wall itself can be can be designed as a straight wall which has been done in the past now the only thing that uh, well what you have to take care is more about i would say about the struts um, because there of course you will have some compression loads if you if you use a ring or something like this and um, the sheet pile itself uh, for the the, the, the ones that we have uh, been involved with, uh, also with large diameters, never had a, a problem 
uh, of the design. It was designed as a straight wall, so a 2D. But for very small diameters, in that case, I would probably, um, that's the way, well, that's the, the typical solutions where we would use plexus, for instance, because it's something that can not be uh, really um, modeled in a 2D, two-dimensional. So this would be something for plexus 3D, for instance. But I cannot tell you which is the radius or what diameter should, because this would also depend on on the length of the piles and the soil conditions. I think that is the last of the questions. Yeah, thank you, Atif. Uh, can I uh, proceed with uh, a balanced presentation? Yeah, please. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Joe and Amrita so for a nice presentation and question answer uh, sessions. Uh, I'm sure you know, so most of this participant must have found uh, so this program uh, useful. And we have uh, more programs in the offering so just would like to uh, present here so can you just take to the next slide we have a dfi india 2020 virtual conference uh, program uh, all of you may know most of you so we used to have a physical event uh, every year uh, during november so considering covid uh, 9 is 20 situation 19 situation so now we move to uh, virtual uh, programs and uh, so we have uh, devised uh, three uh, webinar programs. One is 20th August uh, and 17th, second one is 17th September and third one 22nd October. So uh, we have finally a virtual conference program on 19 and 20. So as a usual practice, uh, the DFI programs are quite popular. So presentation by international experts uh, and uh, various case studies and all so you will have this time to a pool of uh, global experts presenting on the good uh, topics uh, yes can you show the next slide yeah we have uh, international speakers from uh, us europe and uh, other countries so, so we request you all to please participate uh, the program is available so even uh, so you can also download as a part of this uh, uh, this program. So I recommend your all other colleagues and uh, uh, the other professionals also. I'm sure so you can all make the best use of it. So this is the the delegate uh, fee. So it's a very nominal compared to the knowledge you'll gain and. Uh, so can please just go through so dfi member igs member non members uh, students and um, you also want to mention that uh, this is uh, including the uh, next year membership fee also so that way you find uh, so it's uh, quite uh, nominal so please avail this and already who are all corporate members so we have a special fee for them class 4 class 3 class 2 and class 1 and all so paying that fee so that they can uh, uh, send so many delegates, non-member group registration is that. So I request one or one and all to make use of uh, these programs. So DFI programs uh, who all attended, so they know this quite popular, uh, even uh, getting uh, a good mix of owners, uh, contractors, and uh, one and all. So. So sponsorship, the uh, sponsors will have a good reach. Uh, so we welcome to come forward to sponsor uh, these uh, webinar programs as are also the coming conference program. So all of you, I just would like to present that uh, DFI as a part of uh, their uh, programs for India. So they've got uh, 
uh, bigger big pictures to do many things um, so we now we are into implementing uh, new technology skill programs and um, the student initiatives also uh, to for the development of india so so the here are the few major initiatives that are on cfa pile you will know better i think uh, most of the people you also circulated so it's possible to do bore castings to piles uh, presently which takes six seven hours uh, with alternative to technology you can complete 30 40 minutes one pile so 20 25 meter dia also we have uh, done the trial piles tested it and documented it uh, so anybody can adopt this technology in india so suitable to cohesive and cohesive style so similarly you will hear more in the future about uh, addressing geotechnical characteristic uh, uh, issues the uh, programs uh, so we are developing lab technician program field supervisor program government of india approved uh, certificate program so we are also working in uh, uh, enhancing tender practices so we have an initiative for chennai metro so uh, and students also we, we have a the a lot of things to do so there's a platform of women in deep foundations of the web they can join network and uh, so that they can uh, uh, make use of this platform to uh, perform better so so we also planning up uh, to introduce next uh, technology in silical piles and uh, piling grid operators program so we'll hear more on this in the future so next webinar uh, program is on 12th august 20th so please join so this is again uh, title is presented here and uh, Maybe he can see me. He's the project director, so he'll be presenting that. Um, so we look forward for uh, more uh, participation. Thank you, one and all. Uh, so we require for your support, to propagating uh, good practices in, in industry. Thank you, one and all, again. Thank you. Yeah, if I think you can announce closing of this conference today.